Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Who Owns Black Data? Slavery. <laughs> I see my compa Kim Gallen. Um, thank you everybody for being here. This is a symposium, an event, a gathering, a palenque, a refusal, a conversation that has been some time in the making. Um, it emerged as an idea in a conversation on Twitter, um, back when it was Twitter, uh, between myself and Dr. Alex Heal, um, discussing what does it mean to think about who owns black data. And I think what I tweeted was like, who really does? Uh, and that was, I think, 2019. Uh, since then, we have talked about what it might mean to have a gathering of slavery and data, slavery and digital, slavery and history projects coming together to talk about who owns the black historical record, who owns the digital, the born digital, the soon to be digitized cultural artifacts that make up our historical memory globally, across the diaspora, and what does it mean to have control of it? And since then, just even in the last few years, we've seen a lot of different things, a lot of changes, a lot of different conversations about who has control of the narrative. Um, we know that there are conversations about so-called critical race theory. We know that having conversations about curriculum, having conversations about certain topics, not just blackness, queer, trans, all kinds of ways that we have existed in our lives, those are now being seen as something that we cannot talk about, that are criminalized, and that is something that we have to have a real conversation about. And the fact that these conversations are happening also digitally, not just social media, but across data, across data sets, um, where machines are learning data sets that you know, have all kinds of ways of thinking about blackness and black life and black history in them. That is also a conversation that should be our conversation. And so we wanted to gather people together, people who have been doing this for years and years and years and years. Um, projects have been, been really setting the tone for how to think about this and how to think in community on these topics, as well as um, scholars who are just really embarking on a journey towards how data, the digital slavery, reparations, and blackness come together. So we hope that folks enjoy the day. This is meant to be a day of presentations, um, but very short ones, um, so that we have a lot of time for conversation between project participants as well as with the audience. Um, this is also meant to be a day that is you know, multi-genre, right? Because we contain multitudes. So we are very, very glad that the Center for Medical Human Humanities um, allowed us to bring um, the poets in the Uprising Resistance volume for the poets um, from Ink, Sweat, and Tears. Can we have a round of applause for our friends from the UK? Um, they will be giving us readings in between the panel sets to sort of ground us. Um, so thank you all for, uh, for doing that and for the work that y'all have created in conjunction with Underwriting Souls, which is a Black Beyond Data project. Um, this entire event um, is hosted by many, many folks, and you will see um, many of our sponsors, but I should mention some of them here, Johns Hopkins University, Morgan State University, the Kruger School of Arts and Sciences was gracious enough to help us set up a really beautiful live stream. So thank you, Open Range Media, for um, rocking with us, the Center for Africana Studies, as well as the Mellon Foundation, National Historic Public Records Commission, <laughs> um, and many of our really gracious funders, Sheridan Libraries, the Johns Hopkins Department of History, the Diaspora Solidarities Lab, shout out to y'all who are here, yes, um, Black Beyond Data Ecosystem, and, and so, so, so many. And I definitely want to name my co-conveners. Um, uh, Dr. Alexander Wright, who is in sociology um, and <laughs> history of medicine. Um, Dr. Alex Heal, Yale, Yale, Yale University with the Caribbean Digital Scholarship Collective. We're also representing the Slavery Archive Digital Initiative, um, as well as uh, Dr. Nadezhda Webb. Um, and I very much want to um, give a really, really, really special thank you to Dr. Webb, without whom truly this event would not be possible. <laughs> Um, I would like her to come up here. <laughs> um, and I like to, you know, make sure that we give our flowers at the very beginning. Um, so we want to make sure that... Um, I love you. 
Um, it takes a lot to take an idea and a tweet <laughs> and make it into a reality. Um, and Dr. Webb has really, really made this whole thing a success. Whatever happens next, any problems, they're my fault. Blame me or Alex, <laughs> it's on us. Um, so thank you so much, um, Dr. Webb. Last thing I will say before I turn it over to folks that there are a lot of thank yous I have not mentioned. You will see them as they run on the slide. Please, any, you know, like all of, this is a community effort. Like it's a whole community. So, so many hands are on deck. A4 Korshi, create that party. I will, you know, like all the folks, Rachel Labozetta, Megan Zeller, Lisa Enders, all the staff, Caitlin Kane, everybody. So um, this is a community. Everybody be friendly, meet somebody, make a new friend. Um, some key things, our keynote conversation is this evening. It is not here, it is at No Moon 709 Howard Street. Um, we will have a keynote conversation with uh, Dorothy Berry with the Smithsonian uh, Music, National Museum of African American History, Jennifer Morgan with New York University, and Delfina Yawan with Archive Liberia. It is a community space, so please come. And then we will have a bombazo hosted by Semilla Cultural afterwards. So come also ready to dance and drum and sing. Um, and last uh, couple bits. Um, the bathrooms are around the corner, if you come out into your right. Also around the corner is the barber room. The barber room is our sort of almost quiet space. We have curated a moving image, black moving image, black visual courtship room. Thank you to Pedro Dorese, who is our postdoc with the DSL, who assisted in that. If you need a break, heavy topics, tough topics, et cetera, et cetera, or you just kind of want a quiet space, and there is sound, so it's not quite quiet, please feel free to go around the corner and enjoy our B-side room anytime. It's open all day until the closing of the conference. Um, I think that is it for me. Uh, thank you all. Have a great day. Keith Jarrett uh, with Ink, Sweat, and Tears will kick us off with the opening reading. Good morning. Good morning. Hey. Um, it's a real honor to be here today and to be opening up with a reading. Um, I was so like honored to be one of four poets um, and our editor, Boyega, who, who passed away last year, um, and hopefully you'll, you'll hear more about him. Um, we were tasked with responding to a real heavy, heavy, heavy set um, of um, documents um, that were linked with, with slavery. Um, and I'm just gonna read you a bit of an introduction um, which will, will contextualize um, the poem that I'm gonna share. Um, and it all became um, part of this anthology, Uprising and Resistance. Um, so some of you have physical copies but it's also available online. Um, you can just search for it. So, hmm. Just a bit of like UK context as well, right? There was a government commissioned report into racial disparities in the UK. And the report's authors um, talked about slavery as being the Caribbean experience. So that's kind of what we have to deal with on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, so in the pursuit of counter-narratives, I sought out texts that allowed me to engage intimately with this history, with the dead. Because I could not approach the archive with cool detachment, I chose instead to deliberately seek connections with my own history, my own contradictions and anger. I had to find a doorway into these poems, working with and against the records creatively. And so I, sh I struggled with this particular agreement, the Guipuscoa, which you'll hear about, and it's officialese, right? Um, it's a language I don't speak, officialese. It obscures the lives transformed and wrecked by slavery. So I started by inquiring about the ship's name um, and to begin my quest for humanity there. I started listing questions, which of course cannot now be answered. And so I decided to write a letter to the owner of this ship Ferminde Tastet, which became one of many emails. So I'm going to read you the second of an email sequence um, that I've, I wrote to the government report writers and to um, Ferminde Tastet um, with my Jarrett ancestors cheekily copied in. So it's all about mischief, basically. Um, and I want to invite you all to, 
to kind of invoke mischief in your lives. Um, so here we go. To Bakwa Bakaneer 666 at hotmail.com. CC Lloyds of London. BCC Jarrett Ancestors. RV Guipuscoa Agreement. Hello, Fermin. I've been looped into this email, so just jumping in. I'm too tired for pleasantry. Where to even? This contract is troubling, puzzling. I'm measuring my language, Claro. Made a few napkin calculations, or TBH. Used an online calculator tool to string these numbers across our time continuums to bring you into the 21st and help with my mental laboring. So, slaves valued at 45 pounds each at a 1780 rate taken in today's inflation is roughly a 2017 value of Drum roll begin, £3,454.25. Oh yeah, that's $4,363.70. These figures are numbing, astonishing, but the rationale of trafficking is hardly worth imagining. Fermin, honestly, do you feel you've struck a bargain? Total ship value of more than quarter mil, it's staggering. But do you feel the shiver of your future gathering pace around the neck of these lands, laying its hands on the soil over your grave, tightening its grip for a reckoning? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, thank you again, Keith, for your wonderful poem, and, and, and thank you all for um, the last three years that we've been working together on this. Uh, I, I seem to often have the very unenviable task of, of, of following Keith. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to open up the, the first panel today on, on data. Um, Data is obviously the aspects of the material that we all grapple with in the works that we do. And we have presentations from several um, key projects who have been exploring this in detail. We're going to have five minutes for each presentation. And then um, we're going to uh, switch to a short uh, conversation and discussion on these. So um, please introduce yourselves when you come up to present. But we'll start with Archipelagos of Marinage. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Ariana Brown. I am a third year PhD candidate here in the history department at Johns Hopkins. And I am the team lead for Archipelagos and Marinage, which is a micro lab in the DSL. Um, so I just want to shout out our team members. Unfortunately, um, well, we have Laura here in the audience, but <laughs> the rest of the team was unable to make it. Um, so um, we have Hallie, um, who is also a PhD candidate here in the department at Hopkins, who was our former team lead. Um, Dr. Nicole Viglini, who is at Penn State um, doing a postdoc, um, who did a lot of great work building our database, along with Dr. Gregory Smalldown, who is a former um, student um, in the history department here at Hopkins, and Laura Konasek. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to shout them out and their amazing work. Um, so, just to go over the project through the years, um, I came onto the project in 2022, um, and Greg, Hallie, and Nicole really did some amazing work at building our Marinage database. Um, and since then, We've taken the database, worked with community partners in New Orleans, and have built story maps to build curriculum for students in the seventh ward. Um, and we have also, well, we're in the process of, um, of creating a podcast. So for the Marinage database, um, this was for um, Greg, Hallie, and Nicole basically took all of the New Orleans runaway advertisements from 1811 to 1815 
um, that are in the Marinage in the Atlantic World database and transcribed them all um, from French into English and organized them, there's over a thousand, into this database of which I have a screenshot. Um, and they did some really amazing work thinking particularly about keywords and how we're organizing data um, and not just replicating the archive, um, but considering names, ethnicities, languages, um, moments of marinage and how that appears in runaway advertisements. So they're tracking, um, for example, women who are running with children, who are running to find a family. Um, and so they did some really, really meticulous work um, working with that data and doing so really responsibly. Um, so from 2021 into 2022, they were able to take that, build this database, and when analyzing their results, they saw that New Orleans had this really intricate um, network of slave catchers. Um, and it led them into digging more into the 1811 slave revolt, um, in which they're really curious about um, representations of women within that revolt. Um, and so when we went to New Orleans in 2022, um, we met with um, Mr. Leon Waters, who has written the best book on the 1811 revolt. Um, and we were really able to connect with him and connect with community and thinking how we can take this data um, into our community work. Um, and so that leads us to the story map where we um, worked with open curriculum for New Orleans culture, which basically creates curriculum and has it accessible and open to students and uh, teachers in the seventh ward um, where they can bring it into their classrooms and work with students. So we created this story map which teaches students how to um, take runaway advertisements, how to find them in online databases, mine metadata, and become storytellers themselves. I'm sorry for rushing, I know that there's a time. <laughs> but if you all want to talk more, please come find me. Um, and now we are kind of in the fourth phase of the project, which is about storytelling. Um, so we are starting a podcast where each episode is short, 15 minutes, really aiming towards it being accessible for youth. And every episode is about an enslaved woman or girl in the archive. And it's about telling their story that matters um, in the best way possible. Um, and so we have some really awesome contributors that are here in the room. Jessica Newby is going to contribute, and as well as Madeja Leverett. Um, and so for Archipelago's data has, you know, it's been a journey from working with data really meticulously to working with community partners, um, making it accessible and something that can be a teaching tool and also storytelling. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was, that was fantastic. I really look forward to the conversation that we'll have. Um, next up in the order is the Criados, uh, Criados Project, or Tayente Agras. Um, hey. <laughs> um, and we'll be pulling up your story map. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you and to learn from all of you. We're the Criadas Project. I'm Abigail Vasquez Rosario. I'm joined with Rosa Emilia Cordero Cruz, and we work um, under Dr. B, um, who we lovingly call Dr. B, but Dr. Sarah Bruno. Um, our project is part of Taller Entre Agas, which is a three-tiered project looking at black Puerto Rican data focused on black Puerto Rican life. And we are under the DSL as well as the CKL, which are two black feminist decolonial labs. Um, and so our uh, Dr. B's project started um, with the PICO papers. And the PICO papers are a set of 1,044 pages full of census records from the 1910 census, 1920 census, 1935 census, 1930 census, as well as police records. And she was inherited the PICO papers from her mentor, Dr. Francisco Scarano, and she literally got this on floppy disk and had to transcribe it into the data form that we have now, which we then um, 
work on for narratives um, focus on these black women and black girls, which Rosa will talk more about. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about how the Criadas project came to be. This is of course Dr. Sarah Bruno's you know, child, <laughs> brainchild. Um, basically what happened is that Dr. Bruno was interested in looking at black Puerto Rican women during the post-emancipation period. And that's how she landed on the category of Criada, which was this fixed a a gender, age, and labor category that like, you know, when looking upon it, you thought it had to deal with like black women who were laboring in these white households as domestic workers. But then upon further inspection of the Pico papers and looking into this category of criada, it, we started noticing that the majority of the criadas were actually black girls. So in that process, we were like, okay, we can't be talking about black women. We have to talk about black women and girls because if not, we're, you know, a unknowingly assisting in the adultification of these girls that were actually, you know, six, seven, eight years old laboring in these white households. So what we did was we ended up originally focusing on the category of criada, which again, during this post-emancipation period, was focusing on the young girls and women laboring in these white households. But then eventually we ended up expanding our category because as the time passes, the criada category expands to also include other women that are doing domestic work. So we started looking at lavanderas, so washerwomen, ironers, it cooks, et cetera, et cetera, and adding them into our database. And it, here you can see how we're organizing the data and the different columns that we're filling up with information. And basically what we're trying to do with these different columns is to try to like kind of create a more complete or as complete of a narrative that we can about these young girls and women, or you know, at least point towards the archival violences that are, you know, keeping us from creating this more complete narrative. So the way that we do it, our most important column, I would say, the one that we really, really poured our hearts and souls into is the other column, which is the column where we kind of, you know, speculate and use all of our, you know, black feminist historical theories and methodologies to try to like create this narrative but we also have a column for last names to, you know, even if the data is really like one dimensional, like most of the time it's only like Maria seven in school, that's it. You know, them having a last name and us creating this column for last names kind of, kind of like gives space for their family, gives space for their community and kind of, you know, allows us to know that there's more, but the, it, the documentation is just, not telling us that information. So with that, I'm gonna leave it to Dr. B, who's gonna give us a narrative. We're gonna skip two of those. That one, skip that one, and then here. So from the spreadsheet, um, then we started working on like, trying to piece these lives together, right? And I thought I was just gonna be looking at lives, you know? It was a very, I wanna step into the archive and hear someone speak type of vibe, but it was a computer, you know? Um, and what happened was I started to see that if you're into Puerto Rican studies like we are, you know that people call us like the whitest Caribbean island. But we start seeing that that was facilitated through census records. We have Leoncia Ayala, who starts as a black woman, becomes mulata, color, and then she ends up a full white woman at the end, right? Um, we also start seeing that after 1930 and 1935, the US took over the census, and so what occurs is there's a new category of color, right? That's supposed to just be more ambiguous, more light, and we start to see that being facilitated. And so we see a lot of different things happening um, in these spreadsheets, but ultimately, we're now working with a DH consultant firm who's helping us create an actual searchable database. And so we're using their template to input it so that folks will be able to search for names, so that 
one of the challenges, because I think it's important to talk about challenges, was we really had to talk about and explain to developers how someone could have multiple races and change races. And so that was one of the hurdles we had to get through, but we got through it. So we're starting to migrate in like two weeks. So pray for Abby and Rosa while they do that. Um, but thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Um, our third presentation will be from the Early Caribbean Digital Archive. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> so who we are, the Early Caribbean Digital Archive is an open access digital archive holding pre 20th century materials and resources about the Caribbean. Our founders, Drs. Nicole Algio and Elizabeth Maddock Dillon, learned of the difficulties that um, Caribbean researchers experienced, so they set on this journey to establishing ECDA. We believe that a decolonial archive provides establishing ECDA with the goal of decolonizing the archive. And we believe that a decolonial archive provides people with unlimited access to archival materials, teaches them ways in which the archive should not be seen as a monolith of truth because of its colonial nature, and does not perpetuate colonial violences like silencing of colonized voices. So who owned the data? The need to decolonize the question begs this question. The archive begs this question. The data, much like the people in its records, were owned by colonists who base, whose biases led them to collect materials that told a contradictory and peculiar story of what they call the truth. The truth, quote unquote. We know that within these truths are profoundly loud silences whose difficult recovery advances sometimes towards impossibility. Yet, ECDA finds ways to excavate the hidden and decipher the silence by including scholarly introductions to texts in our exhibits and metadata practices, which we'll be talking about today. Thank you, yeah. Um, so, like many of you, oh, sorry. Um, we all think about here um, the ownership and recuperation of data and like material. Um, and about obstructing colonial power and giving power back to the people through our work. Um, the pursuit of such a thing is really complicated. Um, sorry, the, I keep getting these pop-ups. Uh, <laughs> um, as colonialism, imperialism is really ripe, re even at the sort of institutions we're at right now. Um, but uh, the digital realm is particularly fruitful as you know, I feel like I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. Um, the digital realm is fruitful for remixing metadata because it does not mandate that it be linked to a singular object or a unit. It can kind of be um, chopped and screwed and mixed around in interesting ways. Um, and that requires a bit of re-engineering uh, re of metadata. Um, and this gives us the ability to take sort of unique and even radical approaches to our methodology. So, I'm not sure how visible this is, um, but this is our most recent reimagining of our metadata. Um, and what we do here um, is add, we sort of similar to other projects that's spoken, um, we've added new categories to what um, our DRS, our digital repository system usually requires. Um, and this is because we wanted to push the bounds of information, uh, or what rather, what, val uh, what information is seen as most valuable. Um, and this includes sort of secondary categories for things like expanding languages used, um, location, speakers, and not just like authors, so they, in, within our embedded narratives, our embedded slave narratives. Um, and what I think this does is really expose the globality of colonial, um, of this uh, transatlantic slave trade. Um, so it's no longer the sort of Americas and the metropole as the sort of hub of knowledge, but also we can mark places on the Gold Coast or just places throughout Africa, as well as indigenous people. So it's things like marking um, things printed in Boston as not just 
located in Boston, but in on Wampanoag land, or um, printed things, pr information about enslaved people as being the, um, located in um, some places like Ghana instead of being located in Jamaica, um, or rather colonial Jamaica. Uh, so an example that we use often is the narrative of Clara. So this is a narrative of an enslaved woman who talks about um, inoculation for the disease of yaws, which is like a skin disease. And she mentions that it happens through um, taking an infected bit of skin uh, and putting it in an incision in the thigh of an infant. And what happens is that child will get yaws as a child, but um, as an infant, but it's easier to pass um, because of their immune system than as an adult um, or even as a toddler. Uh, and Brian Edwards, whose text it's living within, um, kind of sees it as this like kind of gross, barbaric thing that this enslaved woman is doing, even though it's actually quite effective. And so um, what our metadata does is excerpt Clara's narrative and then um, rewrites the metadata in which she's seen as like a purveyor of medical knowledge. And so it's not just this sort of doubtful um, British man who is a planter and not even a scientist himself or a medical expert or a physician, um, but instead we see Clara as actually having a really valuable intellect and that can be sort of traced back um, to the Gold Coast where she is from and not just where this, place, where this piece was printed in Ireland. Um, and so for us, this is really exciting um, because again, it's about reclaiming ownership. It's about um, sort of acknowledging that things were happening everywhere, not just where the people in power say they're happening. Um, and these are just sort of smaller categorical things we can do, but they have larger impacts. Our metadata is something that can be scooped up and taken out by mapping projects, um, by people doing medical histories and all sorts of things like that. So thinking about the power of metadata is really important to us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, next up, I'm proud and happy and excited to introduce uh, Keywords for Black Louisiana. Morning. I'm just tall enough in heels, so I'm terrified of what would happen if I was in my bare feet. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, good morning, everyone. So I'm going to kick us off. My name is Jemiah Davis, and I'm here with my colleague, Laura Konasek, and we are from the digital team of Keywords for Black Louisiana, and we're going to share our recent work on organizing, describing, and sharing the data for our project. Today, our focus is on our data dictionary, and we'll be making the case that when black data has been subsumed or overshadowed, particularly in curation by white institutions, a combination of innovative and best practices towards careful description and curation can offer one tool for repair. So briefly, Keywords for Black Louisiana was founded in fall 2020, K4BL. Researchers close read the collection of 18th century French and Spanish colonial documents digitized by the Louisiana Historical Center for stories of black and black native life. When our researchers find documents that tell these stories, they create a record in our bias set with metadata ranging from the original LHC description to new categories like keywords. They also transcribe and translate these documents to make them accessible to a wider audience. And our job on the digital team is to construct the website where their hard work will be presented and showcased. Our team overall is a cross-institutional, inter rank collective of students, staff, and faculty, and we work closely with black Louisiana-based scholars, activists, community organizers, culture bearers, and public historians. Our work is made possible from support from the NHPRC and Sheridan Libraries. And so you can check out our QR code for more. Oh, no. Have I done it wrong? I don't think so. Was I not, tr I'm not to be trusted with the clicker, I think. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna give it to you, Jemiah. Okay. Awesome. All right, so as Jemiah noted um, earlier, the research team uh, has been developing a combination of data repeated from the LHC and original metadata from their research practice. Go ahead, next slide. Okay, cool. Thank you. The original bias set included short descriptions of each metadata category focused on creating the best categories to meet our needs and standards without feeling tethered to the prescribed standards. Some 
were more detailed than others. <laughs> but we reached a point where shared standards and best practices were necessary for increasing the rigor and legibility of what we were going to soon put out into the world. Um, for the sake of time though, we'd like to thank uh, Dr. McGinn, Emily McGinn of the Sheridan Libraries, Jess Neal of Vanguard Consulting, <laughs> Michelle Jenowicki of, uh, sorry, I've lost my place. Sheridan Libraries, Dr. Jenny Williams and John Baines from Kinfolkology, and Dr. Brian Wagner from Louisiana Slave Conspiracies. All of these collaborators have helped us get started, and Jemaya really has taken the major lead on our team. It cannot be understated how much work she has done um, for what we have produced this semester, so this is mostly thanks to her. Oh, that is so sweet. Um, <laughs> so, okay. So in the work surrounding our next steps with the website, we started to discuss how to draw connections between our data and the methods we use for creating them. And so we studied data dictionaries and control vocabularies for parallels, inspirations, and potential tensions. And so we began to examine our metadata in relation to others to see if we could develop a crosswalk of similarities and differences between the two. This included data dictionaries from like Dublin Core and slave.org and the Hall database. And so while undertaking this process, we realized that we needed to clean up some of our own descriptions. Uh, certain metadata categories had more description than others, ranging from functional definitions to repeated punctuation marks. And so I went in the Airtable to evaluate our metadata descriptions and color code them based on how close they were to a functional definition. So green meant solid and red meant in need of severe improvement or context with various colors in between like blue or purple. And so to do this, we migrated the descriptions from Airtable to a Google Doc. And then from the initial color coding, we went back through the terms as a group to review, edit, tweak, and overall improve the definitions. Highlighting the successfully improved with the color yellow for review. And then finally, once completed, each term was highlighted with green. Certain terms required more complex and theoretical thinking than others, like language versus name. Each term is being meticulously poured over and analyzed to create a proper representation of what the term encapsulates. And so Laura will wrap us up with one specific example. Yes, yeah, so as Jemaya noted, language is one of the metadata terms that our team has been grappling with. Um, and we thought we'd share with you today how the unique contours of our data set has facilitated both our discussion of this term and the working definition that we currently have. Um, language is an interesting example because it appears in our bias set about documents to refer to the language that the document was originally recorded in, but it also appears in our people set about the people who we find in our documents to refer to the languages that they themselves knew. Um, so as you can see, the metadata term for languages underscore known is defined here as the description in the document of the languages that the person spoke or knew. This is how our data set it seeks to push past the erasure of indigenous and African languages. So rather than base the metadata category, and thus our understanding of language and utterance in colonial Louisiana upon the languages of either the Spanish or French colonial administration, languages underscore known seeks to resist an imperial binary of categorization for black and brown people. Languages known, underscore known shifts the focus from colonial assumptions uh, to the dynamic and multilingual world that defined life in 18th century Louisiana. Uh, so one of the documents, for example, that we've been working with, it titled Janot Testifies in the Case of the Disappearance of Enslaver Corbin, is exemplary. A colonial document written in French, we meet in its pages a 37-year-old enslaved man of a, the Bambara nation named Janot, imprisoned and interrogating regarding the disappearance of a neighboring enslaver. The notation that Janot is a man of the Bambara nation points us to the reality of his multilingual world. Bambara nation, though, is not a place, but rather a colonial constructed category that could refer to what is modern day Santa Gambia, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Cote d'Ivoire. However, we know that Bambara itself is a language spoken throughout this region, and from another document in which Janot appears, we know that he's a Bambara speaker. And so, um, this document mentions another language as well, Fawn, spoken in the region of Nigeria, Togo, and Benin. And so we have this sort of dynamic world at play, and the language metadata category 
um, even though we don't account for fun because it's not a language spoken by Janot, the framing of it allows us to really think through and consider a rich linguistic landscape more broadly and for us to be more conscientious of those realities and possibilities across the arch archives documents using the people set. Uh, nevertheless, even as this framing opens possibilities, our team uh, is, continues to raise questions, you should have seen our 315, March 15th meeting, um, about the nature of our definition and how we could continue to think about languages underscored known. And so, to like kind of wrap us up, um, the descriptions will pass through our data expert, Dr. McGinn, as well as the research team and likely editorial and community advisors before publication on the site. And so our community partners, such as culture bearers, scholars, activists, artists, and archivists, and the like, play a central role in our workflow and, and in the evolution of the project on the digital side. And at our summer workshops, we have revealed the various data sets to community partners in evolving formats. From the Airtable to fully translated and transcribed documents with abstracts to stories to sites, to our site's beta launch coming summer 2024, and receive tremendous and honest feedback from them. So in conclusion, Keywords constantly strives to place black and black native stories at the forefront in the curation and careful description of black data to make black data accessible and answer not just who owns black data, but who is black data. Thank you. Thank you so much, Keywords. Now, last but not least in the presentations before we move to um, our discussion, is unsilencing slavery. All right, so good morning, everyone. Good morning. So wonderful to see you all, I, in person as well as virtually. And um, I want to echo thanks to the organizers, one right here. Alex Hill, um, Dr. Jessica Marie Johnson, Dr. Nadijda Webb, and um, Dr. Alexander White. And of course, we know it takes a village, right, to put on anything, including a conference like this. So to everybody who has assisted in any way with this conference, thank you. And also, I like to also you know, send out a special thanks to those people who came before us to prepare the room for us, to clean it up, to organize it before we arrived, and those who will come and do what they need to do to clean up the messes we hopefully will not leave for them, um, and they will do that long after we have left the building. So just a reminder as well. So um, I decided, usually I don't do a PowerPoint, so this was sort of weird, very weird for me to do one. Nice. But I decided to, oh, that's nice. All right, so I decided to do it, and um, yeah, so to sort of keep me on track a little bit. So um, first and foremost, okay, so how do we do this now? Do we just press this? Oh my goodness, magic. Okay, so first and foremost, I wanted to actually include a list of some, this is not even everybody, um, collaborators of this project, right? And, and fortunately, early, early on, I realized I would not be doing this on my own um, and that I would actually need people to help me and I would want them to be willing participants, if at all possible. Um, and so Alex is listed here. Thanks for my boot once here. Yeah, here. My boot. But of course, like, and one person who I hoped would be here would be Kayama Glover, um, who encouraged me to go to some of these sessions on the Digital Caribbean. And most of those sessions I would go to, and I would understand maybe 10 minutes of the hour and a half, and I would leave, and I would say, am I gonna really go back to that again? And then I would, and it wasn't a, a form of punishment, it was actually really um, enlightening, so, and Alex was part of that. 
So one, um, and I'm, I was thinking about presenting this not to all of you who maybe know exactly what you want to do and are doing it, but really to, to folks who, like me, are not 21st century techies, but 20th century techies who are really anxious about even beginning something like this, right? So the first thing is don't do it on your own. Always have wonderful collaborators. And be selective about who you choose. Um, so the next lesson is with everything in life, everything, ask yourself, what's the purpose, what's it for? Um, so I do this with all of my relationships, all of the ships that I choose to join with people on, friendships, intimate partnerships, whatever it may be. And this is also one of them, right? And so, you know, to think about what it is that you're really trying to do and why are you doing it, right? Because if, you're, if you do not have clarity on that, you will not have clarity on the project itself, right? So um, for me, and I'm not going to go into Annie Palmer, you can read about her, but basically part of the reason I wanted to center this project and the book on enslaved persons at Rose Hall was because they were not centered at the tour that I took with my daughter, right? Um, now it's been a decade ago that we did that. Uh, so that was really important for me to do that. So they were, the enslaved persons were at the center of it. And then also to think about how would I try to reveal something about their lives, right? And, and certainly it would be about their names. I got very focused on their names at one point. Uh, but I didn't want it to be just their names, right? Though for me, that was going to be enough. Um, and we'll show you with the, the website what I did in the end. And it was important that it was that every single enslaved person who was named in any of the records I came across would be included. That ended up being 208 people. Um, and it was important that... Uh, whether, you know, for one of the people, Isaac, who was mentioned on the very first page of the Rose Hall Journal, that was a thousand pages of handwritten notes, um, and he appears um, as a note because he has passed, and that's all I have of, of Isaac, to somebody like Dorinda, who was a midwife, who I had many, many, many references to. All right. And then the other thing is, what's the process? What's the process you're going to use? So I think about this as a pretend process. You actually will come up with what you imagine it to be, and it's going to change like everything else in life. So try to be open to those changes. Recognize it's a journey. And you never know what might seem like a, a distraction as a botheration in one moment might become something really beautiful and wonderful when you see it differently, right? So be open to the process. Um, and then finally, uh, it was important for me to visualize this in some way. So had I known that I would be, many years later, putting this up on a screen for other people to see, maybe I would have taken a little bit more time. But this was the, the image that I came up with. And for me, again, um, let me go back to this. For me, it was important for the people to be at the center. Um, and I wasn't even sure with the question marks here whether I would even mention Rose Hall or, you know, Annie Palmer or any of that. Um, so that was really what was important to me and also including some of the archival documents. All right, and I'm going to skip quickly because I'm not going to, this is, don't worry about it. these are documents. Uh, we're going to bring up the website, but in case when I bring it up, this goes away, because depending if somebody has opened it, I wanted the purpose to be at the very beginning, right? And that you would actually, maybe you would read it, maybe you wouldn't. My hope is that you would. You'd have to click out of that before you actually get into it, right? All right, so let's go to the website. And that's on the first. And then there's like, OK, so this is what it looks like after you've clicked out. But then we're going to go to it. That's just thanks. And then if we go oh, to the beginning, it. and then we can click. Oh, here we go. It's click. at the bottom. So how do I? You can't click. You can't see it live. So we got to talk about it. OK, so you see, this is why. Look at me. Look at me. I am proactive. I knew what to do. Oh, gosh. OK, so 
Um, so this is what, so it was really important to us, and I know you remember these conversations, right? I was like, I want, I, there's gotta be a way for everybody to be on that when you open it up. And Moisir is like, everybody? I'm like, everybody's gotta be there. So what we did, initially we had these straight lines. So first it was like the circles, I was thinking generationally, right? And then we, Moisir was like, we can do the straight lines and maybe we can have 208 of them. And then you remember the conversation we had, and it was like, do they have to be straight lines? Can we add some texture so it's curved, right? And then eventually it became this, which we call the flower of Rose Hall, and each of the petals represent people, right? So we don't have photographs, but how can we present something, some visualization that is lovely and graceful and beautiful, right? Um, and colorful, right? Um, and then we decided up here, so these are all the names, I mean, it goes on, right? Um, and up here, what you can do is also, when you click on a person's name, there's a biography that we've created for each of those people that comes from the archival material, but also provides some sort of historical context about their lives, right? Um, okay, cool, thank you. All right, hold on, hold on, hold on, one minute. I, it's important to point out because I'm, this is the data panel, just the, the one minute you just drew on it, like, okay. That, uh, there's a couple of things here that this does. The purpose, number one, was of course to recenter the lives of the folk that had been erased by the, uh, by the tour guides at the, at the plantation and by the literature. But there's some data, interesting data points that need to be made here. That the petals there are a critique of social scientific conventions of representing data when we speak of data we often speak of their representation. In usually in 2024, we speak of their visualis the representation in a visualization. So we wanted to push against those things. There's a way to think about this graphic you're looking at as a pie chart, but a in a pie chart, you aggregate things. And aggregation of data has harmed our communities. So one of the things that I learned through Alondra Nelson is the power of disaggregating uh, data, right? In the United States, if they count diabetes for all the people at the same time, you won't see the racial differences and the class differences, right? So this is a critique of the pie chart, a critique of the representation of human subjects. Throughout the building of this process, every single thing we did with the data was trying to avoid redoing the violence of the datafication of the people. I mean, the, you looked at the picture of those registers, that's the beginning of the dehumanization. It's tied to the datafication of it. So we wanted, this is what we, how we end up with petals. This is how we end up with disaggregated data and with the microhistories for every single person, something a social scientist would not do. So the take home message I hope you guys take from this website, uh, besides the importance of centering the folk, is also that we can actually change the ways that data is represented. It's up to us to reverse that damage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I now look forward to a really rich discussion. If all of the uh, presenters could come up to the front and, and take a seat, we're gonna bring some chairs, some more chairs up and I'm, I'm gonna sit on the floor or just stand here. But um, I, we want to have a, a brief discussion for about 15 minutes. All right, thank you all so much. Um, a lot of important words were used throughout the presentations. Archival violences, silences profoundly loud, chopped and screwed, um, and reclaiming ownership. I want to ask first and foremost, what happens when data about black people and historical figures are created and curated by black folks, descendants, those who um, have key ties to, to these data? But yeah, do you have a mic? And it's on? Yes, okay. Um, I, I'd say briefly, one of the things that uh, was really important to me, and this was a, a goal I had in graduate school um, that was just realized, right, in 2022, but 
I really wanted to write something that focused on Jamaica, specifically Jamaican women and slavery. Um, and when I started at Duke in 1990, that was what I thought I would do. Um, I went on another journey um, that was not focused on Jamaica or on um, uh, enslaved women there. Uh, so this was something I wanted to come back to. I'm originally from Jamaica, um, and I thought it was important to do some kind of project. Uh, I would say that even though I'm not from Montego Bay, um, I'm from Kingston, that uh, when I came across the list of women, that first 1817 list, and there was a woman named Celia um, and a woman, a Creole, a woman not born in the African continent named Celia, and an African-born woman named Cecilia, that it took me a while to actually get back to that document, um, that I actually emotionally struggled from the very beginning. Um, as I read more and more about Celia's life. And in the end, Celia uh, ended up being the only Creole woman that I found at Rose Hall that had children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren there as well. So there's a, there was a connection that I made um, to Celia, who I'm sure I'm not related to directly. Uh, and I don't know, you know, sometimes I wonder when I look around the Spanish town archives at, at people who are not Jamaican, who have come from afar, from foreign um, England, and what, what they're seeing, you know, what, what, they're, what is revealed to them. Um, and I would just say this last thing, which is related and not related, but it's also interesting to see how racial and gender dynamics operate on the ground in archives there. Um, there are a couple of people I won't name publicly, um, white men um, who are prominently known um, as Caribbeanists who treated the archivists there, mostly women, as his servants. And so, you know, it, the, the archival site, right, is so important in revealing so much, right, on and off the, the record. Okay, so when you asked the question, I was kind of taken back to when I first was introduced to keywords, and it was actually with like the research team, and I remember it was me and two of the honors students, because we're all a part of like the Xavier Exponential Honors Program, and it was me, Leah, and Olivia, and I remember reading through like the Louisiana Historical Quarterly, and just the, the liberation that came from that experience that Dr. Johnson was able to like create for us, even just the word story, to characterize what we were reading. And I remember we would meet like on Fridays and we would have like highlights because we all had like iPads and just highlights of these, these stories that either was all on the same page or like across different pages and the way we could come and be excited and be like, we found this story and it just, it was more than just the removed degrading way that black people were described in the Louisiana Historical Quarterly, but a way to encapsulate it as a real genuine story about people, about human beings, and the recognition that story, slavery was well documented. It kind of erased the notion that, oh, like, oh, well, you're never going to know. Like, there's no history. There's no documentation. There's no way to really know what was going on. And so to be like, it was my freshman year in college. It was a really liberating experience for me. And so to go from that to being on the digital team, to me, black people being in these spaces, which I think kind of goes back to what we were talking about yesterday, is really liberating. And so I can talk about digital humanities with my friends now when it comes up at school, and we had a whole conversation in the library about it, because they were like, what is digital humanities? And I was like, oh, I think I can explain like what I'm doing and, and what that means. And so it's a, it's a really exciting experience, at least for me, to be a part of it, and especially with people like Laura and Ellie and Shanice. So that's just my two cents. Hi, everyone. I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about the Criadas Project. And my dissertation work and my, uh, like, the book I'm working on right now is actually on, like, music and feeling. And I'm looking at, can black Puerto Rican women like what is the history of feeling using music as a site and method? I stumbled into DH, I stumbled into the Criadas Project. 
And I think for me, what, as I've researched and learned more, is that some of these folks, um, you could go to churches in Puerto Rico, and on the floor there are tiles, and I'll say like, so-and-so is buried here, right? And I'll be like, criada of so-and-so buried here. And people walk over them all the time, right? Like you might not ever notice. And I think what happens when black folks are in charge of black data is that it becomes kind of like altar work as well, right? Um, it takes a moment to sit with it there was another time we did um, a, a like virtual event on the last like um, in slave ship like slave ship to come to Puerto Rico. It was in the summer, and there was a historian there who had wrote about it, and he it was about these kids who had died, right? And the cause of death was like from crying. So I asked a question, right? Like, what do you think about that? Like the the emotional toll, the mental health. And he was a white Puerto Rican. He was like, Sarah, you're reading too much into it. And I think that that's the key difference, actually. So um, I want to ask, we're running low on time, but this is wonderful. And I wish we could stay on for a lot longer. Um, I want to ask a final question. Uh, and, it, and it comes from, um, in no small part, the, the last presentation. but. So often in academia, we're pushed to flatten data, to aggregate, to simplify and streamline. So all of your presentations spoke about resisting that disaggregation, embracing the complexity, embracing the humanity in these materials. I wonder if you could speak about that, that experience of, of refusing um, the, the, the aggregation or the flattening of human lives in the data. Yeah, so with archipelagos, I think it kind of speaks with the arc of the project itself, where we worked with data that may feel very scientific, um, but challenging that with how the data base is built, um, and also choosing what we do with that data. So it was really important that it was in collaboration with community, it was important that we all as a team flew and go to New Orleans. We met with many different um, community organizers and activists while we were there. Um, and for us, it's, I, I was reflecting on it yesterday with some colleagues of like where the podcast is going now. And to a certain degree, it may sound simple of telling a story about one woman, but there's actually nothing simple about that. It's quite radical. Like, and I, to say that their lives mattered, their stories mattered, and we can just repeat that and say it in a way that's accessible and concise is enough. And I think for us it's important to think of like challenging even how us as scholars may think of the work that we produce as being simple. Like getting to those basics, getting to the human, and maybe not needing a, um, a podcast episode that, you know, is about a dissertation or a book, but just a remembrance and this is a woman, this is her name, we can step into the archive and get to her and her voice as much as possible and that is beyond important, um, is really something that uh, is, is, I think it's at the soul of it. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, it was really important to have these individual profiles of every single person and there is no profile that is exactly the same as another. And so it was important as I was writing them to think about the individuality as well, right? A part of the disaggregation process. Um, and also how people are connected, right? So about their individual lives, but also the connections that we had specific information for, but also that could be imagined. Um, so I think both the individuality, recognizing the fullness of their individuality and also the capaciousness of their humanity it was really important. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think a lot about um, also curation of certain documents and uh, here at the ECDA we have these embedded slave narratives which are sort of extracted from these several volumes, sometimes thousand page texts. Um, 
and sort of work of curation and how that can not only highlight the enslaved subject, but it can also, I think, help uh, younger scholars or people who are just interested in Caribbean history sort of recognize themselves and like sort of see um, what's embedded in these texts that they may have dismissed because they're so used to them being solely just tools of like a record of colonial violence and not realizing, you know, um, Clara is someone's ancestor and like, they're very much here um, and they're worth highlighting and noting and sort of bolstering and I think that act of curation um, and of sort of guidance is really important because it, um, it shows people that might have never gotten access to a text like Brian Edwards um, to see that there's more than just, again, violence there. So um, I think curation is also a big thing. Thank you so much. Um, well, now only leaves for me to say thank you so much for your time, for your work, for your energies on all of your projects, and thank you for being here today. We're going to take a quick break, but thank, let, me, uh, let us join together in, in thanking the presenters once again. Yeah.